In this video, we're going to be talking about errors in statistical decision making. I'll start with a few quick notes. When I say errors here, this doesn't necessarily mean that the researcher made a mistake. It's possible that even if the researcher did everything perfectly, collected their data well, you know, ran studies that were reliable and valid, didn't make any mistakes in their actual analyses, it's possible even under those sorts of circumstances that the final decision that the researcher made, either to reject the null to say that there's a real effect, or to fail to reject the null to say that you know, the researcher doesn't think there's a real effect, it's possible that that is still wrong. That final decision is still an error. And the reason for this is because everything in statistics is probabilistic. You'll see this very soon, but what we're doing in inferential statistics specifically is we're trying to make a best guess about populations. We don't know the truth. We're just trying to make a best guess, and even the best of guesses can be incorrect. And so you're going to see that coming into play several times here. There's also going to be lots of jargon, so I really encourage you to try your best to get comfortable with these terms that I'm already using, like rejecting the null and failing to reject the null. You can watch my previous videos if you're still uncomfortable with that, but for now I'm just going to dive right in. So there are two possibilities in the world. The first possibility is that there's actually no effect for whatever you're interested in. This is to say that the null hypothesis is actually true. A second possibility is that there is an effect, in which case the alternative hypothesis is true. Now only one of these can be true, and one of them must be true because they cover all possibilities. This refers back to the idea I introduced in a previous video of the null and alternative together being mutually exclusive and exhaustive. So what we're going to do in this video is we're going to play pretend. We're going to kind of flip-flop back and forth and pretend that we know that either the null is actually true or the alternative is actually true, and we're going to see what decisions we can make. So first of all, let's start with the null hypothesis actually being true. So we're pretending that we know for a fact there's no effect in the world. Normally you wouldn't know, but again, we're just pretending. So here's one decision you can make. If the null is true and you fail to reject the null, did you just make an error or is this a correct decision? Take a moment to think about it because it is kind of challenging applying this jargon if you're not used to it. So this is actually a correct decision. If you fail to reject the null, you're failing to reject the idea that there is no effect, which is good because there actually is no effect. So now let's change to the alternative being true and we're pretending this is actually the case. If you reject the null and the alternative is true, this is again a correct decision. There is an actual effect in the world, and you rejected the idea that there's no effect. So again, a correct decision. Now let's change back here. So if the null hypothesis is true, and you reject the null hypothesis, what kind of a decision did you make now? A good one or an error? Well, think about it. You just rejected the null, and the null is true. You rejected a true idea, which is an incorrect decision. You said, I believe there's an effect, when in reality, the null is true and there is no effect. And finally, let's just round this out with the fourth and final possible decision you can make here. Let's say that the alternative hypothesis is true and there actually is an effect, and you fail to reject the null. This is the most hated decision because this is a double, triple, or quadruple negative, I suppose. It's very hard to kind of parse this out, but let's do our best. First of all, I'll mention this is an incorrect decision. We'll see why in a moment. So the null is false. The alternative is true. You failed to reject the null, and the null is false. You failed to reject a false idea. This is a mistake, right? And let's get a little bit more specific because in reality, each of these four decisions has a name, or three as we'll see, and knowing those names really helps you to remember and understand what these things are all about. So let's start over here. This rejecting the null when the null is true, this incorrect decision is called a type one error. You can already make a guess about what this incorrect decision will be called, but I'll mention, as I kind of foreshadowed a minute ago, I'll give you some alternative names rather than these unhelpful ones to remember what these are all about. So a type one error occurs when no effect is present, which is to say you're only observing sampling error, but the researcher rejects the null hypothesis. Again, very jargony, but here's how I like to remember what a type one error is, by the alternative name, false alarm. Think about what a false alarm means. If a smoke detector goes off when there's no fire, 
that's a false alarm. That's an incorrect decision. Just like when a scientist or whatever is doing research, if the scientist thinks there's an effect when there actually isn't, that's a false alarm. And that's what a type 1 error is. We also have this third name, so we have type 1 error, false alarm, and alpha error as a third name, because as we'll see, what influences type 1 errors is going to be your alpha level, which is typically 0.05. So to see that, let's kind of get a little bit more specific in, you know, when a type 1 error occurs. So a type 1 error occurs when you find something in the critical region, go back to a previous video of mine if you're not sure what that is, we found something in the critical region and we called it extreme enough to be a real effect when in reality it was not. There's no effect present. Now remember, a critical region, where those are, completely that's determined by your alpha level, which is completely under your control. And this is why we call type 1 errors alpha errors. And let me illustrate that. So this is kind of a, a callback to our neuro IQ example where, you know, we wanted to see whether this supplement changed people's IQ scores after 30 days of taking the supplement. And we know that this is, again, IQ scores. So we know that IQ scores on average are 100 with a standard deviation of 15 and all that good stuff. So here's an alpha level of 0.05, right? This is the standard. An alpha level of 0.05 will give you this critical boundary and this critical boundary. These are totally determined by your alpha level, as we'll see. So let's say you did this study and you found, after taking NeuroIQ for 30 days, people's IQ that you observed on average was 140 in your sample. So in this case, this is in the critical boundary, right? The critical region, excuse me. So we would reject the null, reject the idea that NeuroIQ is ineffective, which is to say, in this case, we would say, wow, NeuroIQ is effective at changing people's IQ scores because the observed sample mean IQ score is in the critical region based on an alpha level of 0.05, which means, again, we'll accept only the 5% most extreme samples, 2.5% here and 2.5% here, as good enough evidence to reject the null, to believe there's a real effect. But watch what happens when you change our alpha of 0.05 to 0.01. So I'll flip-flop back and forth. You can see what happens to the critical boundaries, what happens to the critical regions. So here's 0.05, but if we change to an alpha level of 0.01, look what happens to our result of 140. It's no longer in that critical region, and so in this case, we would make the decision to fail to reject the null. We would say we do not have strong enough evidence to believe that neural IQ actually changes IQ scores. So if the true state of the world is that neural IQ is totally ineffective, being more strict, right, accepting only the 1% most extreme samples as good enough evidence to reject the null actually helped us to make a correct decision here. We changed our odds of making a correct decision versus a mistake just by changing our alpha level. So again, pause that and rewind if that's a little bit much. I know it's really abstract and it's a lot of jargon. It'll take some time to fully understand, but you know, once you put that effort in, it really will make sense. So type 1 error rates are completely under your control, and the probability is just equal to alpha when the true state of the world is that the null hypothesis is true. Again, jargony, but here's a tough question for you. If the alternative hypothesis is true, what proportion of the time could we false alarm? Well, actually, never. We would never false alarm if the alternative is true, because think about what this means. The alternative being true means that in reality, there is an effect. You cannot false alarm to a real effect. That would just be a correct alarm, okay? So it's only when the null hypothesis is true that your type 1 error rate is equal to alpha. So we're going to write over here the probability of this type 1 error when the null is true is equal to your alpha level. And now let's focus on the second type of error called a type 2 error, but again, I'll give you some more helpful alternative names. Now, this is when the alternative hypothesis is true and there actually is an effect. So a type 2 error is when a real effect is present, but a researcher fails to reject the null hypothesis. And here's the alternative name that will make this much more easy to understand, miss. So the idea behind a type 2 error is that there's a real effect out there and you failed to detect it. You missed that real effect, okay? We also call this a beta error simply because the probability of a type 2 error when the alternative hypothesis is true is beta. But again, here's where we get really complex. If you can understand this, that's amazing. This is a true test of whether you fully, fully understand this. 
if the null hypothesis is true, you cannot commit a type 2 error. Think about why this is. You can't miss an effect that does not exist. The null says no effect exists. So if that's actually the case, you can't miss no effect. There has to be an effect for you to miss it, and that's where it's equal to beta up here. All right, so I want to take just a minute or two to mention these two correct decisions because these have names as well. This first decision, when the null, when, excuse me, when the alternative hypothesis is true and you reject the null correctly, you said, yes, I believe the alternative is true and it actually is. This is called statistical power. You'll notice that the probability of statistical power is equal to one minus beta. This is where we can find beta. Typically, you would do something called a power analysis that we won't learn in these videos, but uh, that you can easily do to basically quantify how much power you have. And if you know how much power you have, well, your power is equal to 1 minus beta, so then it's really easy to solve for beta, which tells you your type 2 error rate. So your statistical power is how well a test can detect a real effect and reject the null hypothesis when it is, in fact, false. This is a very jargony way of saying it's a researcher's ability to correctly detect a real effect, and this is what we want. If there's a real effect out there, we want to be able to detect it, and if we can, that's called statistical power. You'll notice, by the way, that the two probabilities here, beta and 1 minus beta, total to 1. If you were to add up beta plus 1 minus beta, you're left over with 1. And that's because if the alternative hypothesis is true, you have only two options. You either fail to reject the null or you reject the null. There's no third options. So the probability together of both of these must equal 1. And we're going to see the same thing over here. The probability of a type 1 error equals alpha. So if both of these together, these decisions together, need to total to 1, then the probability of this decision needs to be 1 minus alpha. So typically, if alpha is 0.05, your specificity is going to equal 0.95. Specificity, I won't spend a lot of time on, but it's your uh, basically ability to say correctly, no, this is not a real effect. The null is true, and you fail to reject the null. And these are your four possible decisions, two correct decisions and two errors when doing science.